Hey guys, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about the New Zealand rifle, their new infantry rifle. In my hands I have a Steyr Rog, and in 1988 the New Zealand Military Defense Forces adopted the Steyr Rog, which was originally designed and adopted um, in Austria in 1977. So a uh, decade later they adopted the rifle. And they continue to use it right up until the Persian Gulf, and they are an ally of the United States. While they're not a NATO member, they are um, one of our key allies, and they've assisted us in, in past conflicts, and they assisted us in Afghanistan. And they had reports of various problems with the F-88, the Steyrog, and they were seeking a rifle to replace it. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video, the LMT Mars L rifle, which replaced this rifle in the Kiwi military service. And Kiwi is a nickname that even the New Zealanders use to describe themselves. They have it on their patches and stuff that they'll even wear on their military uniforms. So anyway, uh, let's get started by firing the Steyr Aug. And this one is a pre-ban with a 20 inch barrel. The Steyr Aug was actually quite innovative when it was first uh, adopted or introduced to the militaries. Um, this has a quick change barrel system. You would find them as shorter barrels. They were capable of being adopted for left-handed uh, ejection. So if you're a left-handed shooter, you wouldn't have your face by the firing port because you could put a left-hand bolt in here and swap out the port cover and the gun would eject out the other side. However, the charging handle remained on the left-hand side and for a left-handed user, they would have to rotate the rifle to charge the weapon. So they, this was an early attempt at making an ambi rifle for infantry troops out of a bullpup, but it was kind of half-baked. It didn't quite get there. Uh, more modern rifles like the Tavor and the X95 are truly uh, convertible to either left or right-handed use. But anyway, made, made extensive use of polymer, and again, was extremely forward thinking for the 1970s. This one uses its standard polymer 30 round magazine. We have 20 rounds of Federal. Um, this is 223 American Eagle that we have loaded into the gun. The gun is a short stroke gas piston. This will be important later in the discussion. And it has a gas regulator right here, and you have two positions for high and low settings. And uh, again, it uses a short stroke gas piston for its operation. This one has the original donut of death reticle in it, and the reticle is really interesting. Uh, it just has a simple donut, and uh, you just center the target in this big coarse donut, and you'll score hits, believe it or not. It actually works surprisingly well. Rolling off the table here. And she locks open the last shot fired. And yes, guys, I'm still dealing with that rotator cuff, so that's why I'm doing a lot of firing from the seated position. But anyway, yeah, very, very cool rifle, very interesting, but it's also interesting to note that the New Zealanders had problems with this rifle in Afghanistan, and there are other militaries currently using it that apparently didn't have the same problems. So whatever the reason was, it did prompt them to move to a new system which we're gonna show you now. We would like to thank our friends at Big Daddy Unlimited for helping to make this and other videos possible. If you'd like to help us out, swing by the BDU website and just for 99 cents, you can try out their service for one month. And they're basically like the Sam's Club of the online world. So check them out. If you would like to stay a member, go by militaryarms.org. There's a big link right at the top of the website and you can stay a member for 20% off every month going forward. So please check them out. This is the Mars L. It's the modular ambi rifle system light. And this is the rifle that was adopted by the New Zealand Defense Forces to replace the F-88, which again, they were having problems with in Afghanistan. And this rifle has a number of interesting features, which we'll go over here shortly in the video. And I should also mention that the light designation doesn't mean the physical weight of the rifle. It's in reference to the caliber 5.56. But this is the rifle for the most part, which is a 99% clone of the actual rifle that was adopted by the New Zealand Defense Forces. It is available on the US market, so you can purchase them. Uh, if you shop around, you can probably find one. You might find it on places like Gun Broker, but if you go there, you're gonna pay exorbitant prices for the rifles. But anyway, we're gonna do a little bit of shooting with the rifle today. We're gonna talk about some of the features that makes it different than other M16s in military use around the world by uh, our allies or friendly nations. And yeah, and just talk about the capabilities of this firearm. And what's really cool is the fact that this rifle is an M16, which was adopted about two years ago by a modern military. And that in and of itself is pretty impressive to me and is a testament to the M16 design 
as, as a whole. You know, 55 years after its adoption by the U.S. military, we still have countries out there adopting versions of it as new infantry rifles. So it loads just like a standard M16. It has the ambi charging handle, and again, it is in standard 5.56. Today, we are shooting some Federal 55 grain American Eagle, which is supplied to us by our friends over at Federal. We'd like to thank them for doing that. And let's start off by hitting this challenge target at 100 yards with the ACOG. So this rifle has a direct gas system in it, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. And it shoots just like any other M16 M4 I've ever shot, but it has some pretty cool features. Let's talk about some of those features. The Mars L, let's go over it from the butt stock or work our way up towards the muzzle. It has an adjustable length to pull stock on it. You'll notice here that it has this gray finish that's rubbing off. Now I was watching some videos uh, from the New Zealand Defense Forces that they've made about the rifle and it seems that they also have the same finish that easily rubs off, but it makes for a very smooth uh, movement of that stock when you collapse it. Now it's intended to be <clears throat> run either fully extended or if you're running, running body armor or something like that, you can bring the stock down because the ACOG that they adopted, and this is a similar ACOG to what they actually adopted uh, in New Zealand, you have a very short eye relief. So you're gonna have to get that rifle much closer to the shooter's face than you would with a normal optic. But the stock does have the capabilities of you know, storing M&Ms or spare batteries in it, things like that. And it's a very simple stock to use along with, it has uh, sling attachment points on either side of it. Moving forward, they retain the forward assist. They have ambi fire controls, which are present on both sides of the rifle. This one just has semi and safe. The, the military version obviously would have one more position, which would be over here for full auto. We also have an ambi bolt release and bolt stop. And this is one of the more uh, usable versions I've seen on the market. So it's very easy for me with my long fingers to reach up there even with the knuckle and hit that uh, bolt stop, pull the bolt to the rear and lock it. And then when I go to release it, it has a ping pong paddle, just like on the other side of the rifle, that's very easy to hit and drop that bolt to go forward. Again, that's mirrored on the other side. So it has a standard uh, paddle mag bolt stop, or not mag, you know, bolt stop and bolt release on that side. The magazine release, which I got ahead of myself there, is right here, just like a typical AR-15 M16 with the fencing around it. You know, you push that button, drop the magazine out. On the opposite side, you have the capability of pushing this lever to drop the magazine out. It's a little bit smaller, it's abbreviated, and it's behind its own protective fencing here so it won't accidentally get bumped. The magwell itself, it's flared out, which you can see here, so they call this an enhanced magwell. And let me see if I can find a simple tool here really quick. Not sure if I can find one. I wanna show you another feature. A lot of people don't know this about the original M16 but you have a winter trigger guard on the original M16. And you use the tip of a bullet to depress this plunger and flip it down. Now that functionality has been retained in the Mars L rifle. You can still get to the trigger, even though because it's, um, they've, they've enlarged this area here, typically it just goes straight across on a standard M16. They've enlarged it for a gloved hand, but they've retained that winter trigger capabilities for shooting this gun with say a mitten. And to put it back, you just, Hit that plunger, it locks back into place. You notice it has this ergo type grip on it as well, which gives a very comfortable feel to the firearm. You not only have the storage in the buttstock, but if you pry on this little rubber piece on the bottom, there's more storage in the pistol grip itself. Now this is not very um, positive in terms of, of retention of that plate. It's just a simple rubber stopper that easily pulls off. I wouldn't put anything in there that you wanna keep. Now moving forward, this is where things get really interesting. Of course, it has a standard port cover and a standard A2 type deflector for left-handed use. They'll keep that brass from coming back and hitting a left-handed shooter in the face. But 
what really makes this rifle stand out uh, is, is two things. First of all, it is a solid piece of aluminum billet that is machined both the upper receiver and the handguard itself. So this is all one chunk of aluminum. There's no bolts, there's no seams, there's no anything holding it together. So that monolithic upper allows you to have Picatinny rail that runs all the way out to allow you to mount force multipliers and not worry about a handguard rail system shifting and you know either causing a laser designator to, not no, to no longer point uh, at the target, to, to go off target, or if you have um, you know, a scope that needs to go out here past the receiver to mount. You don't have to worry about losing zero, which you can with handguard type rail systems. So that monolithic rail really serves to strengthen the rigidity of the gun. And it does bump the weight up to about 7.1 pounds to seven and a half pounds or so um, without it being loaded. So it does have a little bit of muzzle heaviness to it. It does have 1913 rails all the way around. I have the LMT panels on here and these are just heat protective panels. But as you can see, you have the T-slots all the way down. Now it's also worth noting that not only do we have the T-slots, but here we have a QD mounting point on both ends of the rail on both sides of the rifle. Another feature that is somewhat unique to this gun is the fact you have these two screws here. And when you purchase the rifle, it comes with a tool to quickly remove the barrel. So you loosen these two nuts and then you can pull the barrel system completely out of the rifle. Now this would be meant to be done at the armorer's level in the military and uh, that would allow you to quickly replace the barrel should you need to. I put this a little too far back there. Move it back to one, one slot. There we go. So in doing that, it's a very unique system in how it pinches that barrel and when you pull the barrel out, put it back in, it really does minimize the amount of shift, a zero shift that you will experience. So it doesn't require you know, re-zeroing the rifle typically. Also, this is a true free-floated barrel. It's a direct gas impingement system. It's using a mid-length gas system. And the gas tube itself, if you take a look at an M4 carbine, it kind of has a, a dog leg in the gas tube. And that's a failure point. When you get those, those gas tubes really, really hot, they usually fail right around where those bends are in the gas tube. LMT designed this rifle with a gas tube that goes straight back into the receiver. And again, it's mid-length. Now, this is a one and seven inch twist barrel. It is a, a chrome lined barrel and of course it's chambered in 556 on the end we have a surefire muzzle device for a suppressor but it also acts as a compensator on the right hand side of the barrel we have the mounting point for a standard m7 type bayonet and the reason it is on the right hand side of the barrel is because along with this rifle uh, the kiwis adopted a lmt manufactured m203 grenade launcher which would attach to the bottom pick rail and they wanted to be able to mount a bayonet and still be able to use the m203 grenade launcher which you press the button push the, the barrel system forward put a round in it close it back up and fire it uh, to maintain that functionality of having a bayonet affixed to the rifle while using the, the m203 or having it mounted that's the reason that's on there now i don't know when the last time is any modern military did a bayonet charge but they still wanted to be able to have that that uh, bayonet on there despite the fact of the m203 so it also comes with uh, flip-up sights and the rear sight's kind of hard to see here but is adjustable and it's set in meters it has the aperture that flips so you have a coarse aperture for uh, cqb and then you have a more fine aperture for more precise aiming at range but the rifle was not intended to be used with the backup sights the rear sight's adjustable for uh, windage the front sight is adjustable for elevation the primary optic that the Kiwis adopted would be a scope very similar to this. This isn't the exact scope, but this is very similar. It's a Trijicon ACOG 4 power, 4x32. And this is the primary optic that's fixed to all the Mars L rifles that the Kiwis are using, along with a Trijicon RMR mounted on top. It does have the fiber optic daylight uh, culminator on top of it. That would be correct for the rifle. And so they really like this scope system over the donut of death or the reticle system they're using on the F-88. For them, this increased the hit probability for their soldiers considerably. So this is a complete Mars L rifle. For the most part, sans the vertical grip that the Kiwis also adopted. I don't know the manufacturer. I've been searching online, trying to figure out who makes the actual folding grip that the Kiwis are using on their Mars L rifles that are issued with the firearms, and I can't find that. If you guys know what that vertical grip is, please comment down below because I'd like to pick one up to complete the look of this clone of the Mars L rifle. 
The Styrog and the Mars L in their firing positions, I have this set to how I would normally fire it, are roughly the same size. But keep in mind, this has a 16 inch barrel and the AUG has a full 20 inch barrel. So you get more velocity out of that 55 grain ball round or you know whatever you're using. Uh, you're still gonna have higher velocity with the 20 inch barrel. But a lot of militaries are using 14 and a half, 16 inch, 18 inch barrels uh, in 5.56 these days and not going with a full 20 inch barrel. The Styrog, there's a big difference, a couple of big differences between how this gun operates and how the Mars L rifle operates. And there's gonna be some transitional training there, obviously, and of course this is a couple of years ago when they adopted the Mars L. But this rifle, when you go from semi-automatic to fully automatic, to fire it semi-automatic, you pull the trigger back until it fires, then release it, it fires that one round. If you pull a little bit harder and pin that trigger to the rear, this gun then goes full auto in its military configuration. This is a semi-automatic only rifle, a civilian rifle. So that's a big difference. Here we have a selector lever, so you can select semi or uh, full. So you have safe, semi, then one more position again would be fully automatic versus just how hard you pull on the trigger. I can only imagine the heat of battle, you'd be doing a whole lot of unintentional full auto firing with a trigger system like that of the AUG. I've always often wondered about that. I've only had the opportunity to fire full auto AUGs a couple of times in my life, and I found it really difficult uh, to get used to that trigger. But with practice, it's obviously quite easy to do. The other big difference between the rifles, other than one's a bullpup, one is it, is that this is a short stroke gas piston system where the New Zealand for Defense Forces went with a direct, a direct gas impingement system in place of it. And there's always this big debate, which is better than the other. I'm a big advocate of DI. I think that in the M16, uh, DI is the only way to go. I think the gas piston systems are, are just, um, it, it's, it's shoehorning something into the gun it wasn't designed to do, and it causes a, a number of different other problems. And the DI system, as we've been proving in our BCM tests, ongoing BCM tests, we're up to 7,000 rounds now without lubricating, cleaning, or even wiping down one of the internal components of the rifle, we fired 7,000 rounds without a single malfunction. So the notion that direct gas is somehow dirty or it poops where it eats, it's kind of being dispelled by that series of videos. So the direct gas system, will allow for a little bit more mild recoil impulse. And it also, I think, um, is an extremely reliable system. Now, when we call it direct gas, we've done a video on this. It taps gas off up here. A straight gas rod brings the gas back into the carrier. We'll show you what the gun looks like on the inside. Here's the ambi charging handle that was adopted. Here's the trigger group. Now this is a semi-automatic trigger group, but you can see it's a very nice two-stage trigger. But when gas is brought back from that gas tube into the carrier, it's vented down into this expansion chamber and the hot gases expand and push this bolt away from the carrier. So this would be the lock position. The gases would expand that bolt would spring away and push the bolt and carrier system rearward and the XX gases would be vented through these two ports on the side. So it's really an internal piston system used on the M16 versus a true direct gas impingement rifle. It's just redirecting the gas into an expansion chamber, a piston contained within the bolt carrier itself. And to me, it's one of the most ingenious things ever um, designed for modern rifles. Eugene Stoner was an absolute genius. So this rifle disassembles and reassembles just like a standard M16. I don't need to go into the details. You can see the cotter pin there. This one is cut with a semi-automatic bolt carrier, but you'll notice that it does not have the enhanced bolt carrier group that LMT is known for. This is what the Kiwis adopted. The fit and finish on the gun seems really, really solid with the exception of this finish wearing off on the buffer tube. It is a mil-spec buffer tube. And again, I have seen the same wear patterns on the actual rifles that are being fielded. Charging the weapon can be done easily from the right or left hand because of the ambi charging system. And it can easily be fired left-handed, which I don't do so well.
Smooth shooting rifle. Very, very cool. I've never been a big fan of mounting RMRs on top of Trijicons, uh, but you know, that's the way the Kiwis decided to go. You would just turn the sight on and then use it in CQB applications. If you're going to run a red dot sight, I think what uh, the gun game industry kind of came up with is probably the best option where you put an offset mount up here and just shoot the rifle sideways versus having it mounted up here uh, with any type of head attire like a ball cap, which most military units have some sort of uh, headgear that they will wear as part of their uniform. This gets in the way. And so uh, not, not a big fan of that. But otherwise, the rifle system seems to be very complete and well thought out, and certainly very well made. Overall, I think that the New Zealand Defense Forces definitely took a step forward in adopting the Mars L rifle. And again, it's just kind of funny that the M16, over 55 years after its adoption by the US military, is still being adopted by modern militaries in some form or fashion around the world. And I'm not saying in large numbers, but the fact this was adopted just two years ago means that the M16 still is one of the top dogs out there and probably, in my opinion, one of the best infantry rifles ever devised uh, by man. And uh, yeah. That'll start a flame war down the comments section, I'm sure. In the end, it seems to be a quality rifle. Uh, again, I like the fact that they can you know, quickly change the barrels at the armorer level. Uh, it maintains zero. It certainly seems to have the accuracy uh, there, which is something that the Kiwis said they definitely wanted. But the AUG was also known for being quite accurate itself, even though it had uh, an, an actual quick change barrel that the soldier themselves could quick change simply by pushing a button and pulling the barrel out of the gun. This does require the use of tools. But being completely ambi, the fact the gun throws the spent cases forward, it definitely is left-handed friendly. So this gun is gonna serve, I think, the New Zealand Defense Forces quite well. I will say that early on, they did run into some problems with the rifles. They had uh, some improperly tempered or heat-treated firing pins that were failing, but LMT swapped all those out. And again, there's about 9,040 rifles to delivered to the New Zealand Defense Forces of the Mars L rifle. Guys, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel so we can continue to bring you unbiased as humanly possible information like today, please become a Patreon supporter. There is a link down below. We are supported by you, our viewing audience, not by LMT or anybody else. Also, please check out the little join button right underneath the video player right here on YouTube. You can click that join button, check out some of the perks and consider supporting us right here again on YouTube. And last but not least, swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Guys, thanks for 12 years of support and we will Talk to you soon.